So good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, is Daphne Kutihipaki, and I'm the project manager of, uh, of the Match project. Um, uh, we are very happy to see you here today. Uh, we have the pleasure to to welcome uh, about uh, 25 participants uh, here in this room, but we have also uh, another uh, 30 people following us uh, on, online. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, it will be a great opportunity uh, at least to exchange uh, with uh, uh, colleagues with uh, a diverse professional uh, background. Uh, we have representatives of uh, public employment agencies, trade unions, uh, representative of the private sector. Uh, so uh, we are very much looking forward to a, a lively uh, discussion with you. Uh, on, on a brief note on practicalities, uh, uh, please be, be aware that uh, one should wear a mask uh, at all times, except, of course, uh, uh, for uh, the, the, the speakers or when you want to raise a, a question. If you want to connect by yourself, the Wi-Fi code is over there uh, on the whiteboard. So uh, this this event uh, is, is an event uh, is a sorry is, a, is an opportunity to go through uh, a reality check and to brainstorm a little bit on uh, the opportunities but also challenges with the development of uh, labor uh, development uh, uh, schemes uh, mobility schemes sorry in Belgium and in Europe today. So we will start the day with a European perspective, with some welcoming remarks from a representative of the European Commission, Loha Kohado, who is the head of unit for the Legal Pathways and Integration. Uh, she will join us remotely, and this will be followed by a few words from our colleague Gertri uh, Lano, who is our regional uh, uh, thematic specialist on labor mobility. Uh, after this uh, few introductory remarks, uh, we will dive into the specifics of the Belgium uh, labor market and we will get a prospective analysis of the workforce challenges uh, from our colleague from Agoria. And this will, uh, will lead us to a panel discussion, which will be moderated by Davy Mast from uh, VOCA. Uh, so, we will have the pleasure to actually welcome Grégory Pong, Jadila El Basmahaldi, and Nicolas uh, Van Brussel, who will give the, first, the respective position of the three federal uh, entities. But this event will also be an opportunity to discuss then how the labor migration schemes can contribute to tackle workforce challenges and to present the match project. So, let me tell you just a brief word about the project. Uh, I'm sure that you're already aware that this project has been developed by, by the IOM uh, and it is funded by the European Commission. It was launched uh, in January 2020, uh, so this, this year. And here in Belgium, our program is implemented by partners from VOCA, Agoria and VDAB, who are also uh, present here in this room. So the project aims obviously at enabling companies from four European countries so Belgium, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, and Italy, to overcome their workforce challenges by recruiting highly qualified talents from Nigeria and Senegal. Uh, so the, during the presentation that will be made by Rob de, de Lobel, my colleague, uh, we will highlight some key features of our program, uh, and uh, we will uh, discuss how our project aims at, of course, meeting the needs of the private sector, but also contributing to transfer of knowledge, development somehow of the countries uh, of, uh, of origin, in order to make this model sustainable. And the last word of today will come uh, from the CEO of a company who has uh, already joined one of our previous projects uh, with uh, Tunisia, and he has a first-hand experience to share with you about uh, international uh, recruitment. So without further ado, I will now give the floor to Mrs. Corrado, uh, who uh, will then join us remotely and will display her welcoming remarks. Thank you. 
Sorry, we cannot hear you. Uh, we are trying now to fix it. No, we, can, we still cannot hear you, so could you please check also on your side whether the microphones are active? Because we did some testing here, everything seems to work on this side. No, we, we still cannot hear you. Yes, yes that's better. Now we hear you. Thank you. Is it better now? Yes. yes. We, have, we haven't have heard uh, anything yet, so I'm afraid you will have okay. to stop. <laughs> Okay, so as are the inconvenience of uh, yes online <laughs> meetings or hybrid meetings. Uh, can you hear me now? Is this okay now? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Yes. Okay. So I start from the very beginning. So good morning. Um, I'm glad to to be able to join you virtually and hope that uh, the connection will continue to function. Um, I wanted to thank IOM uh, for organizing this event in the context of the MATCH project and on sustainable approaches to labor migration and recruitment strategies. As you might be aware from the Commission, European Commission side, we have been trying to argue from, uh, for many years that we need to use labor migration more strategically to address labor and skill shortages in EU labor markets. We don't do this sufficiently. Uh, we know that on a global scale, uh, we are not competitive, very competitive with other third countries in attracting the, the skills and the talents we need, especially when it comes to highly skilled uh, third country workers. So we need to do more. This is why already uh, in the implementation of the European agenda on migration, besides acting on the legislative side, for example, with the reform of the Blue Card Directive, which we, try, we will try now to conclude in the next months and relaunch the negotiations because we need better rules on attracting highly skilled workers to Europe. But in addition to that, we have encouraged the development of projects on labor migration and mobility with key third countries, uh, in particular at the moment with Africa, as part of our strategy on labor migration and of our relations on migration with third countries. This is one of the projects that have been developed in that context with uh, EU financial support. We have five others that are now ongoing and I'm very glad that, that uh, Belgium is participating not only to this but also to other projects that we are supporting and we are hoping to develop more in cooperation with member states in the next months. We have uh, a call for proposal open so we can finance more projects in the near future. Of course, now the situation is, uh, is challenging for uh, mobility and migration in general due to the impact of COVID, but um, things are starting to uh, progressively improve. Um, there have been uh, travel restrictions, of course, that have limited also um, labor mobility to the European Union. Uh, but I'm glad that now things gradually started to resume and I'm also happy that you have, uh, in the context of this project, you managed to um, rearrange the activities uh, to take into account of the evolving situation. 
Um, so we will have to show uh, a certain flexibility also in the future, but we are confident that we can gradually and progressively um, resume normal activities and relaunch uh, labor migration and mobility as well from third countries. So I welcome very much um, this project. I think uh, that uh, then Gertrude will uh, go into the details of it, so I, I will not. But I'm, I'm glad that there are essential and key elements like skill development, capacity building, and knowledge sharing that are very important in all projects of this kind. It's also very important that a very solid and strong cooperation has been established between public authorities and the private sectors. Of course, cooperation with employers is key uh, in this kind of project. So I'm very glad that this is the case. Uh, now, coming to the future, uh, as you might have heard, next week we, the Commission will finally uh, issue its plans on the new uh, migration and asylum package. Um, I cannot disclose today the details. This will be disclosed on the 23rd of September. But I can certainly tell you that uh, labor migration will be part of the new strategy and will be an important part, including in the cooperation with third countries. So we want to build on the experience that we have had so far uh, as regards the pilot projects on labor migration. We want to upgrade and further develop that in cooperation with member states and launch uh, through partnerships with third countries on skills, talent and, and mobility. So I look forward to further cooperate uh, with all of you on this project and maybe also on other projects in the future. I thank you very much uh, for this invitation and I wish you uh, fruitful discussions. I cannot stay uh, connected myself, but my colleagues will be and will be happy also to contribute to the discussions uh, in the course of, of the morning. Thank you very much. So I think, Hathri, if you'd like to take the floor. Thank you. I think I have sufficient distance from here. I'll remove uh, the mask just for the opening uh, remarks. So my name is uh, Jirka Zamo. I work for the IOM Regional Office in Brussels as the Senior Labor Mobility and Human Development uh, Specialist. Um, and I'm very happy to be here with you today for our first stakeholder meeting, at least the first physical meeting with all of you under the MATCH um, project. Um, just as uh, Laura Corrado already explained, we as IOM uh, are very lucky to be able to implement one of the legal migration pilot projects that the EU is financing in an effort to give more support to member states to try new models of managing skills, mobility, and labor mobility. It's true that in the past few years, there was a bit less attention to that. In 2015, 2016, we saw a large inflow of refugees, and a lot of attention was to how do we manage these you know, immediate arrivals. Um, however, we think it's very important to also have a long-term view. How do we manage migration in the long term? How can migration also benefit us in the long term and to think around migration in a more strategic way. Um, as Laura said, there will be a new pact launched. And of course, uh, we as IOM hope to see also this long-term vision uh, reflected in the pact. So beyond, let's say, possible uh, discussions around you know, the, the asylum system, also look at issues related to labor mobility and how we will cooperate with those countries in the long term to strategically manage uh, migration. At IOM, we are convinced that labor and skills mobility is very important and can benefit all of us. Um, first of all, we all know that in Belgium, as in many other countries in the EU, we are facing more and more an aging population. We are getting old, unfortunately, and it also reflects on our labor market. There are definitely gaps that are there, and I think you know, other experts will go into that in a bit more detail um, for Belgium. So there is a need there in Belgium and in other European countries, while in Africa we see the opposite. There's an extremely young population and, on the other hand, labor markets that are not able to, let's say, absorb all these, you know, 
young talent. Um, so to us, it makes sense that, you know, how can we, you know, manage it in a way that benefits us all? How can we support these young talents in Africa to access um, opportunities in countries like Belgium and other countries where we're actually, you know, in need of such talents um, for our labor market? Um, MASH is, you know, a project that would like to test that, that would like to set up, let's say, a model to see how can we manage in practice this labor and skills mobility. And MASH is, of course, a target in Belgium, but also a few other European countries. We have the Netherlands, Luxembourg, and Italy. And we work in partnership with two countries in Africa, which are Senegal and Nigeria. Um, the idea of MATCH is to give young talents in those countries the opportunity to have a work experience in uh, the EU, um, of course, based on the men that are here, what are the profiles that we need, and to match, so to speak, these African talents with uh, the needs that we see in the companies here in Europe. At the same time, of course, MATCH is also looking at fostering an exchange between different actors, private sector, public actors here in Europe, but also back in Senegal and Nigeria. Because we think, you know, there is a lot that can be done also by sharing these experience, by building capacity, for example, of a public employment service in Senegal, in Nigeria, in terms of how to manage, you know, international labor mobility. And actors like Vivia Biz, Flemish public employment service could play an important role in that, as well as, you know, the other partners of our match um, project. So for us, we're very keen to see how this model can work, um, to try this, to test it, but hopefully to develop something that can be successful and sustainable on a longer term. And this is also why we feel the involvement of the private sector is really key, because for labor mobility schemes to be successful, um, it's not just enough that we have a project like MATCH or that we have the support of the European Commission. First and foremost, you know, we need the interest of the private sector, of the employers, and we have to develop a scheme that also, you know, um, matches um, their needs. So it's great to see that the private sector is also present today and we intervene um, in the discussions. And indeed, unfortunately, when we started the MATCH project, I think, you know, a few Weeks later, uh, the first information about COVID started circulating. Um, but you are still thinking, okay, maybe this is something short term. But the more and more, we of course realize that, you know, um, the virus might be with us for a longer time and not only with us here in Europe, also in the African countries that we are targeting. Um, so this, this has an impact on the project. Um, we, we have reflected a bit with the colleagues, you know, what can we do? Uh, but eventually we came to the conclusion that our project is still relevant, COVID or not, um, because COVID also showed that we really rely on migrant workers here in Europe, you know, whether it's for our food supply chain, you know, the agricultural workers, the seasonal workers that suddenly, you know, couldn't enter to pick the strawberries and the other uh, goods. Same for uh, the health professionals. Um, same for even, you know, IT support for digital solutions that we needed so badly, you know. Um, all of this shows how much we rely actually on migrants, migrant workers. And I also am convinced that, you know, we will need to engage, you know, migrants in the socioeconomic recovery as, you know, we move forward. Um, so I hope today will be an opportunity for all of us to discuss how can we do that in Belgium to share some, you know, strategic visions for promoting uh, labor migration to Belgium. How can we get prepared? And hopefully, you know, we can then test this in practice uh, soon and, you know, uh, develop a successful uh, model. So with this, I think I'll conclude the opening remarks. Um, I'm very much looking forward uh, to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gertli. And uh, we're going now to, to start with the panel discussion. May I ask the panelists to actually join their moderator and sit? Yeah. Oh, did you just try to skip me? Exactly. <laughs> oh. exactly. There was a test to see whether you were still awake. Uh, 
So good morning to all of you. My name is Jeroen Fransen. I work for Agoria, which is the sector federation of technology companies representing uh, over 2,000 technology and uh, digital companies. Um, I know that most of you are already convinced about the importance of migration projects. Otherwise, you would not be here, I suppose. But I want to draw uh, the context, the Belgian context, uh, a little bit deeper because there's a sense of urgency. Um, how do we know? Uh, for three years, I've been examining the, the situation of Belgian labor market and the impact of digitalization on that labor market. We did it based on three analyses. First analysis uh, is a quantitative analysis. So we draw the labor force, we drew the, the labor force baseline. Uh, what is the actual state of our labor market? Who's working? In which region? In which sector? Holding which, which function? And then based on economic growth uh, numbers, uh, National Bank of Belgium, Federal uh, Planning Bureau, CDFOP, a European uh, database, we were able to draw the evolutions of the demand. So what will the numbers of functions look like between now and 2030? This isn't doing much. <laughs> But I know the numbers by heart, so, so no problem. Um, so first analysis is the quantitative analysis. Second analysis is the qualitative analysis. There we looked into the skills one might need at this moment in a digitalizing world. What skills are important at this stage? But again, we also drew the 2030 perspective. So how will the evolution of skills between now and 2030 look like? That's the second analysis. And then the third analysis, and that is in this context perhaps the most important one. We also analyzed the supply. Who at this stage is able to work in Belgium? And based on demography, based on results of education, based on our retirement age, and also based on our migration policy, who will be able to work by 2030? And based on those three, thank you. And based on those three, um, three analyses, we were able to launch a matching algorithm, saying that, okay, these are the baskets of needs for 2030, and let's try to fill these baskets in the best possible way with the potential, with the supply. And then we see that some of the baskets will be easy to fill. Others will be impossible to fill and others will be stable. And from, those, uh, from that matching algorithm, we were able to draw four conclusions. Two of them are really, really important in this context. First conclusion, everyone working in Belgium needs to get their digital skills up to level. That's not, not a surprise. Second conclusion, for 310,000 Belgians, simple upskilling will not be enough. 310,000 Belgians between now and 2030 will lose their jobs because they hold a profile that will no longer be in demand. So first strategy was upskilling. Second strategy is really reskilling. And even if we manage to get everyone or to have everyone on board in these first two groups, so the first group, everyone stays relevant. In the second group, we find jobs for new jobs for everyone. Even if we manage to do that, then we will lack 584,000 people, or we will be able, we will be unable to fulfill 584,000 demands for jobs 
between now and 2030. So that's a huge number. That number, of course, will have to be uh, solved with an activation policy. We will have to activate people in Belgium to work. Um, the numbers say that if everyone works until the age of 69.7, there will no longer be a problem on our labor market. I, I gave uh, several, several presentations on this topic, but I never felt a lot of enthusiasm. On, on the contrary, uh, they once threw a can of Coke uh, <laughs> at me. So, no, but we need to find other solutions. Um, working longer uh, for youngsters, this could also mean start to work earlier in, in uh, alternating educational systems, for instance. But we have an activation uh, mission in our country. Other part of the solution will be the further implementation of technology. And I'm going to make a bold statement, but we need to automate more to kill more jobs. Not to take away your job, Davy, or your job, but to get the repetitive tasks out of the work, to get the dangerous tasks out of the work, and to avoid people's decisions where they make more mistakes than machines do. So we need, in fact, to humanize work. And in those last two categories, technology as a facilitator and activation, uh, the MATCH project suits perfectly uh, in, into that uh, context. Why? In our country, we managed to activate quite well our, our uh, unemployed at this moment. We did, and please do not take COVID into account, uh, but, but we managed to activate over the last few years uh, close to 220,000 people. But we activate them in the health sector, in education, in the sectors with a high cost for the government. So with low productivity. And what we do not manage is for everyone entering the labor market to push other persons to a higher level. So we have a gap on the ladder, we have needs at a pretty high level to make this technology work efficiently, to make this technology work in such a way that our gross domestic product goes up and creates like really high added value. And we calculated that one tenth of the solution could be found through migration. So between now and 2030, they're already based on the actual policy is an effect of plus 160,000 through migration. But we think that we could reach or, or, or uh, grow this number by 30,000 entities. Actual effect based on the actual policy is plus 160,000. We think that we could find 30,000 profiles more and invite them to contribute to our GDP. Um, perhaps one last remark. On the political side, uh, reactions are pretty positive. Of course, the right side says, I'm not expressing on my own political uh, feelings, huh? but the right side says we should avoid to invite too much people to our country. Huh? Migration is puts uh, pressure on our social security, and huh? that's their uh, vision. So I, I would re respond to that, that migration also could contribute to our social security, to our gross domestic product. On the other side, on the left side, <laughs> I often got the remark, um, aren't we organizing a new brain drain in, for instance, Maghreb countries? So those are the two uh, reactions I heard most on the political 
team, in fact. So as a group, as a project management team, we should take that into account. Last remark, because I'm pretty much through my 10 minutes, I, I, I think. Last remark is, of course, COVID, and what is the impact of COVID on this project? Okay, it's a, it's a fact that the bench with candidates, with, uh, with, with um, persons searching for employment, uh, there are more people on the, on the bench at this, at this stage. But we agree with Vidya Bay, with Forem and others, that this situation will probably only last somewhere between 12 and 18 months. And then we will be at the same level that we were at the end of 2019. So close to um, the situation where the labor demand outreaches or is more important than the labor supply. So yes, COVID, um, COVID created a new situation, but it doesn't, it doesn't change our long-term policy and the fact that we have to look for structural solutions. So that was my contribution. And thank you very much for that uh, energizing you know, speech. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Jeroen. Uh, when I heard your presentation a couple of times, but each time I find it really uh, actually uh, really interesting uh, to put our project into the context of more structural needs uh, from the, the Belgium labor market. Uh, we will now have a panel discussion uh, moderated by my colleague Daisy Ma to see how the representative of the three uh, regions here in, in, in Belgium react to uh, the data that has just been uh, disclosed by, uh, by Yerud and uh, also uh, unveil their strategic vision to develop uh, labor migration in, in Belgium. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daphne. Um, I hope everyone hears me. Um, I would like to introduce first the panel members um, very shortly. Um, welcome to um, Jamila, um, which is a lawyer within the policy unit of Department of Work and Social Economy of Flanders Region. And next to me then, um, Nicolas van Bokkenstel, of advisor to the Minister in Charge of Employment in the Walloon Region. And at the right side, um, with your Frank, um, advisor to the Minister in Charge of Employment for the Brussels region, so the three regions in, within uh, our country are represented. Um, I am Davy Maas from VOCA, um, the Chamber of Commerce, West Flanders, um, and um, I'm happy to have this panel discussion regarding actually the labor mobility schemes um, and the opportunities of um, economic migration. Of the presentation of your room, I remembered some statements um, like digitalization is necessary to kill some jobs, uh, retraining, upskilling won't be sufficient uh, for our labor uh, market, um, and the, the opportunity and potential of um, yeah, economic migration is quite big. Uh, one tenth of the need, the, the labor need supply. Um, has to be actually labor uh, migration. Um, so maybe I want to uh, first ask the panel members um, a short reaction on the presentation of your room and their findings on the numbers and potential solutions. Maybe I will start since I uh, am possessing the mic. Okay. Um, I will try to take a bit of a distance. Um, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. It was very clear, and um, um, we are uh, developing a new Flemish uh, labor mi migration policy. We are uh, working very hard uh, for about a few re three years now, and uh, COVID-19 um, has uh, made 
things much difficult, more difficult. People, migrants were uh, not allowed to, to get to the European countries. Uh, Belgium did not deliver the visa B, but now we uh, found we have found a solution. Um, but COVID-19 has um, also um, um, given a solution for the Flemish region. Now, since March 2019, we ask. Uh, the migrants to uh, applic to um, to do their application online uh, instead of uh, by it's, it, before it was just a paper uh, file that we get. So um, we're working very hard uh, on the new Flemish policy, but I think um, we will get to that more in detail. I will give the mic to my colleague. Thank you very much. I hope I will be, I will have no problem with the microphone. <laughs> um, first of all, thank you for inviting me and to, to invite by, through me, uh, the Minister of Employment of the uh, Northern Region. Uh, we really appreciate to, to participate to this kind of event, so thank you very much. Um, thank you to Jeroen Fransen for the introducing presentation, which was uh, very interesting, and um, I think the numbers are really relevant. Uh, we know them, but it's good to to say that uh, we are facing a huge challenge. Um, as, the, uh, as many of us have said, um, the COVID crisis um, should not um, prevent us to to have some long-term policies because uh, upskilling and reskilling of uh, labor labor market forces is uh, Another huge challenge, um, but uh, the crisis uh, forced us to take some policies to maintain jobs before creating jobs. Um, so this is right now the the, the, the biggest uh, issue we have to, to take up as a public authority um, at regional level. Um, that I would like to underline, um, and I think it's the, the the purpose of the second question. So I will wait to to to, the, to specify the the policies we are we are implementing. Thank you. So thank you, uh, everyone. Yeah, we are. I'm very pleased to be here and uh, to to discuss with you because we are in in Brussels now working on a. A new uh, legislation uh, frame, so uh, it's, it's really nice to, to see you and to discuss with you uh, in, in this process. But uh, about the, the presentation, I think we are quite uh, okay with everything I said. I think uh, economic migration is uh, one of the response to uh, the digitalization of uh, the labor market. But uh, Minister Clerfay is Minister of uh, Employment. Uh, professional formation and digital transition. So we are really uh, the minister in Brussels to um, to, to try to uh, have a, a global response to, to that. So uh, yes, we have really to work on upgrading the skills uh, of the workers and of the job seekers. So uh, these are uh, really important stuff uh, in Brussels. We have a lot of workers. Um, we have some difference with uh, the Flemish region and also a little bit with uh, the Wallon, Wallon region. So we will have, we will really have to uh, work uh, hard and harder on upskilling and upgrading the, the competence of workers and uh, job seekers. So uh, there are a lot of things to do there. But of course, uh, economic migration is important. Uh, Brussels region is the uh, smallest region in, in, in Belgium, but uh, we have uh, around 40% uh, of all the single permit of work permit. So uh, we need to be attractive and we want to be attractive for a uh, high profile. Um, so we will continue to, to discuss about that uh, after, but uh, yeah, there is different topics, but uh, for sure uh, economic migration is one, but it's, it's not the only uh, answer. For sure. Okay, thank you for the answers. Um, I heard already from um, Grigory that there are some differences between the regions. Um, maybe my next question can be uh, to, to a little bit more um, explain in detail what are the differences between uh, the regions and, and the strategy maybe? Are there any plans? I heard already from Brussels 
um, that there are plans to change some legislation, but maybe very shortly what the vision of, of the, the regions is with regard to economic migration, because labor supply will always be a problem with economic migration as one of the of the solutions. Of course, not the solution, but it, it's only one uh, part of the solution, of course. Thank you. Um, yes, um, so as my colleague already mentioned, um, the economic migration policy, maybe just a short explanation, is um, is regionalized since the six states before. That means that each region is responsible for the economic migra migration policy. That means that each region develops his own or her, or her own policy. We started, um, we kicked off a new Flemish policy um, on January 1st, 2019 for the uh, third country national employees. And I read that uh, the Brussels region has uh, implemented a bit of the same, it's a, a bit the same. I did not analyze it uh, thoroughly, but I think it's, uh, it's the same policy as uh, Flanders has. Um, it's a bit sad, is maybe not uh, the right word, but you have three different policies. But I think that our um, main strategy is to focus on the concentric uh, model. So we have a concentric model. So we first have to activate the people who are in Belgium in the different regions uh, and start and, and try to activate them uh, in order to fill in the gaps. If it's not possible, we are looking uh, in European countries. The second circle. If we if we cannot find that talent there, then we are um, looking for uh, third countries. So that concentric approach is very uh, important. It, it is not. Um, we do not get to the Maghreb, country, uh, Maghreb countries immediately. It's just when we ne we cannot find the talent here and we cannot activate that talent. We uh, focus on uh, economic migration. So that's a very um, interesting uh, approach. Maybe uh, a few statistics. So I mentioned that we have a new Flemish policy since the 1st of January 2019. Um, in 2019, we had delivered 10,000 work permits, uh, 8,000 were for highly skilled profile, uh, 1,200 were for the structural shortage occupation. Uh, for the structural shortage occupations, we have uh, provided a list. It's a dynamic list of 20 professions that is open for migration. Uh, one of the professions that is mentioned on this is a truck driver. We need truck drivers. <laughs> um, 100, per, uh, 100, 100 permits are uh, provided to seasonal workers and 400 to other categories. So it's, um, the statistics are very clear. We have delivered 8,000 work permits to highly skilled profiles. So that means we have uh, implemented the policy that works. And uh, I hope we uh, can fill in the gaps. Thank you. Um, for the Walloon re region, uh, we do not have such um, um, labor immigration uh, policy. Um, uh, I mean, maybe not uh, so concentric. Concentric, sorry, um, because we our main goal is to to, to fill the gap um, between uh, companies' demand and job seekers and workers' skills offer. Um, and we are we try to to, to fill the gap um, independently. That's if it's uh, third country uh, workers or European workers or Belgian workers. But that's our main goal. Um, to to reach that goal, um, Minister Christy Morel um, is building um, a professional training plan for Wallonia um, with two. Two other two sub goals. Um, first of all, is to to develop um, a training offer for uh, jobs job suffering of workforce shortage, which is a, an important uh, issue in Wallonia. And the second goal is to develop a training offer for jobs of the future, uh, jobs that will be will be created uh, thanks to or because of um, digitalization. Um, despite of that, or additionally of that uh, professional training plan, 
we we are uh, looking or we are uh, thinking of um, uh, digital strategy for uh, for Nunia, and we are uh, implementing several projects to build or to contribute to this uh, strategy. Um, and it's very uh, it's various project. We have projects from European Fund as easy, and projects uh, called um, Start Digital. And the main goal of this project is to uh, upskilling uh, the, the skills of job seekers. Um, we have another project at the regional, uh, at the global level, which is upskills Um And it's more oriented uh, towards the companies and workers uh, in the companies. Um, it's also a project of, at this stage, upskilling. And then we have uh, more in link with uh, uh, Mr. Christy Morel uh, competencies, um, the development of training centers. Uh, we have 24 training centers in Wallonia, but five are specialized in, uh, in tech, in uh, digitization uh, skills. Uh, we are right now um, developing them or reinforcing them. Um, and the last measure is the job, job coaching reform, sorry. So the for, for them, uh, coach coaches the, the job seekers, and we are integrating a digital uh, um, factor in that coaching in order to, to to train them from the start with digital uh, skills. Um, so that's the, the my contribution to to the second question. Um, but sorry, it's not really oriented towards uh, labor migration, but for us, labor migration is integrated in the whole uh, policy uh, I just mentioned. Yeah, as I spoke uh, before, but the other thing I will just uh, speak now about uh, economic migration, but in Brussels, we have really two uh, big uh, views or uh, ideas of uh, economic migration. One is to uh, tackle a uh, job in uh, shortage because we have some uh, job there and there are not uh, job seekers of no competencies now. So we have to work on uh, upgrading their competencies. But for now, we have to have a, a answer to that. So we, we, we really want to uh, have uh, economic migration in that. We are working with uh, Actiris. We have a, a, a dynamic view of uh, job in, in shortage. We are not, uh, for now, uh, working on, uh, with a list. Uh, we have a back office list, but uh, Actiris is uh, looking in the, in the database to know if there is uh, a lot or enough job seekers with the uh, demanded uh, job uh, competencies to answer to a job description. So. We are trying to work uh, uh, in a dynamic way, not to have a, um, a static list that uh, maybe uh, if you are looking for uh, someone who is speaking three languages, uh, you can have uh, 2,000 of job seekers for one job, but he doesn't have the competencies for this special job. So we are trying to look uh, in a dynamic way so we can answer really to the uh, job in, in shortage. If for the future we are trying to have um, a list because uh, it can have uh, predictability, it's uh, uh, easier for companies and uh, for the people to know what are the jobs that are for sure in shortage, but we want to, to continue to, to work in that uh, dynamic way with uh, Actiris. And the second way is that uh, Brussels is, uh, is dynamic. We have a lot of uh, uh, small companies and they need a uh, high profile. And, we really want to attract high profile. So uh, like uh, Flanders, we, we try to, um, to, 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 to put the, the high profile in a better situation in, in Brussels. So it, it goes uh, faster to, to have the permit. Uh, they can have a permit for three years. They can have um, uh, unlimited permit. So we want to, to help them to, to, to stay here or to go back, but if they want to stay here, we want to attract them um, because it's important for, for Brussels and for the economic uh, development of, of Brussels. So yeah, for sure we have to, these two ways of, of, of working and yeah, we will continue to, to do it because we are a little bit now uh, um, 
we still are working with the federal uh, legislation, so it's really hard for everyone to to uh, understand what are the, the rules in Brussels. So we are working on the new uh, Brussels uh, legal frame, and I hope that in a few months we will have it, uh, at least uh, first uh, lecture in the, the government, yeah, for sure. Okay, thank you all. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Sorry, just a little correction. Um, speaking about upskills only a project, uh, I say that it's only upskilling, but I, I made a mistake. We are doing reskilling too, because in detail, uh, the companies, some companies, uh, the, the, the panel of companies will be coached to elaborate a new uh, training plan in the, in, within the company, and then. Uh, for, for example, maybe a worker uh, won't be won't be needed in the future. So the company will have to make a choice. First of all, uh, first choice: I keep my worker, but he will do another thing that he he has made, he, he has done uh, until now, or uh, I I fired uh, the, the worker and, I, and I'm looking for a new one. And as a public authority to maintain the employee. Sorry. Uh, we prefer that the company choose the, the first choice to to keep it, to keep him or her and to give uh, him or her the, the new skills for, for the, the new job. Okay, thank you for this clarification. But I think for the point of view of, of the companies, it's, it's a really an end and end story: uh, upskilling, reskilling, attracting um, non. EU um, as citizens actually just to to to, to be able to, to fill in uh, the vacancies. I heard something uh, also regarding more the procedural elements. So yeah, we have of course the, the single permit framework. Uh, in addition, some um, regional fr uh, legal frameworks. Um, it's not that simple anymore, I think. Um, so the, the single permit is now two years in place. Are there any adjustments needed? What are the visions on, on the single permit? Has it been uh, more easy to attract these people? Of um, Is it not that uh, easy? Also seen the impact of COVID-19, that mobility was not uh, easy at all. Um, what are the thoughts about that uh, single permit um, change? Yes, um, exactly. So uh, we have implemented the directive concerning the single permit. So it's, I think, um, for about yeah, one year and a half, two years. Um, it has simplified a, uh, a bit. So we uh, deliver uh, work permits for highly skilled professionals for three years. Uh, before it was a permit uh, for one year. So each year we have to renew uh, the work permit. Um, now we have a one permit instead of two, uh, um, of course. Um, the, so we have some procedural adjustments. Um, so I already explained that since March 2019, you um, you can apply online. It's not online; it's through mail. Uh, that's because we are working on two uh, counters. So we have uh, a counter of the Department of Work and Social Economy, it's called the VSA Locket. So that's uh, a counter where the first country nationals can apply online. So we are uh, working in uh, um, two or three phases. Um, it's normally, I think it's the 1st of January 2021 that it has to be active. But we also have, uh, we have to make the same uh, exercise for the holders of a professional card, so the uh, entrepreneurs. Um, we are also working on a unique counter, but that is on the federal level, so with uh, um, the region. Uh, it's called the unique counter of Limosa. It uh, contains of three phases. So the first two uh, phases are for the uh, single permit, the work permit, and the last phase, uh, third phase, is for the professional card. We are struggling with a bit of um, issues. Um, we are. Um, 
In Flanders, we are working on a new policy concerning uh, entrepreneurs, so the so the professional card. It's, uh, it's a federal law uh, of uh, 1965, so it's, it's very old. And we want a new Flemish policy to attract uh, innovative entrepreneurs, to attract easily attract startups and scale-ups, etc. cetera. Um, but um, we uh, talked with the other regions, and uh, I think we don't, they don't have any plans to work a new legislation and a new policy uh, concerning the uh, entrepreneurs. So I think it will be an issue for the um, activation of the unique council of the Mosa. Um, so the the people of the, who hold the professional cards cannot uh, do this online, but we have the unique counter on the, the, the level of our department. So for Flanders, it will be able to uh, apply uh, online. Um, the last thing, uh, we have introduced a single permit. It was not an easy because you have uh, a cooperation with uh, different regions. You have uh, the interpretation of art articles that is different between the regions. That was different, not, not anymore now. Uh, you have also the federal government of work who has been, who has been involved. You have uh, uh, the migration office who has been involved. And it's not easy to set up um, a strategy. So I'm very glad that we have the single permit. Um, and. I hope we will uh, soon have a new policy for uh, the professional part. Thank you. Well, that was quite complete. <laughs> um, in Wallonia, we, we just, let's say like this in brackets, um, implemented the, the new legal framework through, a, um, as we, we call it, uh, an IT, governmental IT. Um, it, it adds two two benefits. First uh, benefits was the, the reducing of um, delay or, uh, within the procedure, and the other one um, was that thanks to this um, uh, implementation of new legal framework, we we could uh, transpose uh, made a transposition of um, various directives. Um, this uh, IT has been taken uh, in 2019. Uh, at the end of the former uh, one government by the former minister of, of employment. So apparently um, it's quite too early to 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 evaluate um, the benefits or the adjustment uh, that, that uh, should be made at the government level. But we are making a, an analysis right now. The evaluation is, is, is being made. Um, and soon we, we all that will be be able to, to, to take to, to, to identify the, um, the adjustment and to to, um, to make them. Um, so my colleagues, so, so, so first I, I I forgot to, to mention that I'm not the specialized the specialist uh, within the cabinet for uh, permits, uh, but my colleague uh, told me about uh, common electronic platform. Uh, I don't know if we memorize the name. Okay, so that was the other. So um, we, at the original level, we, uh, our 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 plan is to to contribute to to implement this platform as soon as possible because we think that um, a unique or single desk for all the third countries worker or foreign workers, um, a unique desk in Belgium will be something uh, I think welcome because uh, we know we all know the. The complexity uh, of Belgium and and Belgian levels so sometimes. So um, every time a, a common and unique desk can be made, I think it, it will be uh, better for uh, for our workers. Yes. So um, we are very happy with the the new uh, e, e counter, single e counter, because Brussels is in the center, so it's easier for everyone. I think if there is one gate to everyone to uh, introduce the demand, to follow the demand, to complete the demand, to see if uh, the permit is still uh, uh, valid and so on. So it, it will be very uh, simple for everyone, I think, and easier for everyone to introduce and to, to follow the, the, the permit. So that's a, a very good thing, I think, for uh, the next uh, year. Uh, for us, uh, like uh, Wallonia a little bit, we are we have just implemented single permit, uh, but uh, because we wanted to be to be ready and to be sure that the, the delay for the, the procedure will not uh, increase, so we are we were happy that uh, the 
the, 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 the delay were short and uh, not like in the, the federal uh, level where it, it uh, costs really uh, bigger than before. So we are really happy about that. So now we are working on the, the new Brussels uh, legal frame. Um, we want to, to simplify, we want to be attractive, and we want to uh, add uh, predictability about, like I said, uh, job shortage. Um, and we are still um, now uh, seeing uh, stakeholders and to, to be sure of uh, what we want to do and what we will uh, put in that uh, legal uh, framework. Um, but I think the um, single permit was done, the transposition was done uh, during the refugee crisis, and I think there, there are um, uh, maybe uh, too much things that are now in the single permit uh, frame, and it's uh, complicated for, uh, for a student or a, a researcher. It's, uh, it will be uh, more difficult in a few months uh, than before. Uh, for uh, other permits, uh, they have to, even with the exemption, you have to introduce a single permit. I think um, the idea uh, before was in the, yeah, I, I think there was a, a little bit, uh, yeah, it was because of the refugee crisis that maybe it's more complicated now, and I hope that with the new federal uh, government, we can in the next year maybe uh, simplify and uh, go better with this uh, single permit because I think it's, it, it's better for now for a lot of new procedure, but for some it's really, really more complicated and uh, I hope that we can uh, find solution uh, there for the next year. Okay, thank you all for um your input and, and feedback. I think um, showing here the three regions, the three authorities, I think it's very important that they work intensely together and uh, work with uh, maybe more coherence in the different regions and the rules. I think that coherence is very important as well. I heard some three keywords. Um, timing, I think timing um, to attract those people is very important. So I um, I heard also from the company that it's better now, but with the start of the single permit, it was very difficult to, to get the single permit in time. Digitalization, I think not only for the companies, it's important for, for the people, for the, uh, the employees, but also for the government, the digital, the procedures, I think it would be uh, make it very easy as from my point of view of the companies, of course. And then also, I think it's very interesting that the last point you mentioned, Gregory, to simplify things, uh, maybe put some corrections to the legal framework to, in order to, to have um, yeah, a really simple, understandable legislation rules, because I, I think that's very important if I can yeah, make a conclusion from my point of view to invest in that communication towards companies with regard to economic migration because I think a lot of companies are still not knowing what the opportunities are and the potential of economic migration. And I think that's also a really important task of, of the authorities and the government in order to have that solution, the part of the solution uh, for the future uh, to keep in, uh, in mind. Um, I think maybe it's no time to, to have also the, the opportunity to ask some questions to the panel list of, or to you, of course, um, or maybe if there are any additions from our uh, speakers, it, it's also possible, of course, um, but already want to thank the three panelists to have this discussion. I, I see that you really yep. has already a remark. If it's okay, I would like two minutes uh, for some reactions. Um, two reactions on what has been said, and two uh, thoughts in addition to what has been said. Um, you, you can also go without the microphone. Okay. Here, here, here. okay. I'm not going to touch every microphone here. <laughs> but okay. It's okay. Um, first of all, on, on COVID, I think that COVID could also um, offer us a new approach on labor migration. Labor migration could also mean inviting people from other countries to come over here for project management, project briefings, 
return to their countries and work there so that they stay in touch with their mother country. That's the way we all do it at this moment. We all work from home. From time to time, we go back to the office, we get project briefings, we get in touch with our colleagues, and then we have our, our work uh, at home. So labor migration does not always have to mean I move and I will never see my original country again. So that's the first uh, thought. Second thought on uh, your remark, Nicolas, on, on um, we need to maintain jobs, and that's catching the most of our attention at this stage. I tend to agree, yet I don't know if we have to do a lot of effort to, um, if, if a cachet, for instance, is losing her job at this stage, I don't think it needs a lot of effort to find her a new job as a cachet. This job is disappearing. So I plan for a maximum use of inactivity periods to really upgrade either towards the sectors in high need, um, education, uh, health, or either in a technological uh, uh, development, in, in, in fact. So every period of inactivity, such as caused by COVID, should be used as an opportunity to upskill and not to maintain jobs that at the end are not sustainable uh, jobs. That's my second remark. Third remark on the concentric approach, of course, Flanders says uh, we work with our own labor market potential first, and then we go and look in, into Europe, and then we go and look abroad. Well, our own labor market, um, of course, that can be a priority, but the upskilling movement there is a, is a long one. Not really reskilling projects or, or reskilling paths are somewhere between 12 months and 24 months. So it's not just uh, giving one or two trainings and, and we can activate those people. It's a, it's, it's a work on the long run. European labor market is stable. Needs are more or less the same in every European country. Before we had some uh, Romanian uh, coders or, or Lithuanian coders, but the, the market has developed in such a way that the needs are the same in Europe. So I think that uh, the concentric approach uh, does not have to mean that we, yeah, that we consider labor migration in, in these kinds of projects as third priority. Uh, it's, it's, it's an important uh, track. And then my last remark is on the Brussels region. Brussels is more than Belgian capital, of course. Brussels is also the European capital. Um, we really need highly skilled people over here. Compete with China and the Asian countries to compete with the United States. I am talking about computer power. I'm talking about artificial intelligence. I'm talking about development of healthcare, development of vaccine and, 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 and stuff like that. European scale is too small to really compete. So I think that we have to gather skills, we have to gather knowledge, Europe and Africa, to become a counterweight for other highly developed regions such as the United States, such as the Asian countries. Those were my four remarks that I would like to add to the debate. I think Nicholas has also mentioned Um, hearing Jeroen Franzen and preparing my, my answer, I a bit um, forgot what I, ah, yeah, okay. Um, I, I, I just wanted to add, but it was prior to, to Mene Franzen's uh, contribution, is that if we need um, uh, foreign uh, labor forces and we, we, we make sensibilization, sensibilization to, uh, towards the, the companies to, to, to have this, this kind of workforce, 
as public authorities, uh, it's my personal opinion, and as well as the Mr. Christopher's opinion, that we need to to have to implement or develop the tools as public authorities to welcome this um, this uh, foreign uh, workforce. Um, so we need to digitalize ourselves. Uh, we cannot say, okay, we are facing digitization uh, issues and we need some, some skills from, uh, from third countries workers. And then when they, uh, they are coming to, to, to Belgium, to, to Flanders, to Wallonia or to Brussels, they cannot face um, technical problems or, or electronic problems or paper problems. We need to be coherent with the message uh, we send to the to the foreign labor market and to, to our companies that that are looking for for this workforce. This was my my my, um, my contribution. I wanted to add it um, in reaction to your conclusion um, for the discussion. And as I have the microphone, maybe I will um, I'll ask or respond to to what has just been said. Um, I agree totally to, to the maintaining of um, of uh, employment. That's why I prefer speaking of maintaining of employment. That's maintaining employees. Um, that's that's, that's the, the the vision we have, and that's why um, we are we really like concepts. Or it's more than the concept, but I I didn't mention it. Uh, yes, it's a long life learning or long life training or long life whatever. Um, and it implies that, yes, during your career or your life, you will need to, to, to be redirected or to, to, to choose another direction. And you will need to reskill, to be reskilled. So, yeah, I totally agree, agree with that. And um, that's another big issue we have to tackle. I see that Cedric has a question. Yes, um, so good morning. I have a, a question for, for you guys. Uh, I was wondering if in uh, Belgium or if one of the, the region you have uh, the, you have um, like skills observatory or competencies uh, observatories to have uh, an idea about what's, what do we have on the ground, what do we need, what will we need in the coming months, years, uh, in order to identify the gaps, and how do we fill these gaps with training? And you were talking about uh, this career path, and uh, I agree, people will have to, to get trained, and <coughs> a, cashier, <coughs> a cashier has skills, other competencies that might be used for something else. And once these people are trained, where do they go? Uh, where are they uh, available? Where can they be seen? Where can they be visible for employers? So do you have something like this? Are you planning to develop uh, something similar? Any other questions maybe from the audience first? or? Yes. Maybe we take two or three, and then we, we go back to the panel. Thank you. Yes, hello. Good morning, everybody. Um, my question will relate to uh, what was said about predictability of skill shortages. And uh, uh, my question relates to, OK, how do the different structures in Belgium cooperate with the private sector on this? How are, for example, sector federations, employer federations, or chambers of commerce involved in a dialogue? And this will also link to the question that was raised by, Fred, uh, by Cédric right now as to, okay, how can the matching of skills of available talents and the needs of employers be possibly optimized in that regard? I'm working for the Association of European Chambers of Commerce and Industry, and some of our members, notably in uh, Germany, Slovenia, Italy, have very uh, powerful tools available already right now to provide the necessary skills matching and also to work on the skills forecasting in their respective countries. Thank you. Uh, 
Um, yeah, good morning. I'm Igor, Igor Vanasa from a company Limited to Europe. So we are uh, already 30 years uh, busy with trying to fill some gaps in between uh, from in the Belgium labor market, in fact, by recruiting abroad. Um, I have two uh, maybe uh, questions, uh, of course, related to this uh, subject. On the one hand, we heard uh, Jeroen telling about uh, the sense of urgency. And then I'm always thinking government and sense of urgency, that's not an easy thing. No? So my question is how how this will be uh, uh, done, in fact, and how can we speed up some things which are uh, quite urgent. And on the other hand, and it's a bit linked to that, um, I think there's always a lot of uh, about procedures and single permit and things we can improve and so on. All this, of course, uh, will help, but I think from my experience, the main um, or one of the main issues to attract people is to promote the country. If you go all over the world, what do people know about Belgium? That's um, it's very complicated and we pay a lot of taxes. And that's in fact basically what they know. So we need to promote also our country and are we going to promote Flanders, Brussels regions, Wallonia, Belgium? whatever, but I think it's an important thing to uh, yeah, to think about uh, how can we put Belgium on the map as being uh, top of mind when people are thinking about working somewhere else than in their own country. Yeah. We come back to the, so we take these three and then we, we go back to the, to the next question. Sorry. Yes, thank you. So for uh, the observatory, we have one in Brussels. It's uh, called uh, View Brussels. It's uh, with activists, uh, Brussels Formation and uh, VDAB uh, Brussels. So uh, they have done uh, last year a big uh, social and economic monitoring. And now they are working uh, on the also job shortage and, and so on, done the, the pre predictability on it. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, one of the topics and one of the mission of uh, View Brussels. Uh, it's uh, going better and better, and we want to um, uh, improve it. Uh, so that is on the only um, admi administrative side. On the other side, we have uh, the Pôle Emploi Formation. It's uh, a collaboration uh, between um, public sector, so administration and uh, social partners in, in Brussels. And uh, I think uh, two of them at least, uh, I think maybe three, but at least two are really working on uh, job shortage. It's the for uh, construction uh, because there, there are a lot of uh, job shortage. So they are working on uh, how to tackle it and how to uh, to, to fund and or to, to see what will be the next job shortage, but also in a digital city where uh, Agoria uh, is uh, in Brussels, and uh, we really have to, to, to think about what will be the next job. So we want to, to work with uh, social partners in, uh, that, um, in that way. Uh, yes, so it uh, also answers a little bit the question of the, the predictability. Uh, we are trying to, to work on it, and we are working with uh, social partners, at least in the Pôle uh, Emploi Formation, but uh, our door is uh, always open if you want to, to discuss uh, with uh, the Brussels region about just job shortage and how, uh, you, what's your uh, vision to tackle it. You can always uh, come to, to speak with us. We are open with discussion, and uh, so... Um, no problem. And for the attractivity of Brussels, uh, for sure, we have to work on it. It's maybe not the mission of uh, the employment uh, minister, but um, as it's been said, we are working in Brussels also on the reform of uh, professional cards, so for <laughs> entrepreneurs and for companies. And um, I hope that we can uh, work with uh, Hub Brussels and uh, with the Minister of uh, Foreign uh, Commerce to uh, attract more and more uh, companies and uh, entrepreneurs in Brussels and to, to give a better uh, image of, of, of Brussels. So we are working on that, but it's the other topics of economic migration, it's on the professional card, but maybe we can expand that uh, discussion to a single permit and work permit, but uh, for sure we are working on that uh, with professional card and uh, up uh, Brussels, yeah.
Maybe uh, if I may to to have two remarks, I think it is a very important point to to yeah to indeed promote the region. I think that's a very important uh, remark. And second, I think there is a difference between the supply and the demand. I think on the supply, there are yeah view on the competences yeah then on the one hand employees, on the other hand job seekers. I think job seekers there there are yeah plans to to have that and and, and yeah. The view on those competences, but I think regard to the employees, there's there's still a lot of work to do to have those competences. Um, yeah, in 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 image, uh, also that also are um, yeah the the responsibilities of of the employers themselves as well. But I think that could um, have more interaction between the government and uh, employers. It wouldn't be. Um, that um, and on the demand, I think yeah, there are a lot of organizations working together to have that view on the future demand of which jobs are needed. Also, international um, reports, and I think that is a difference I would I want to make. Thank you. Um, maybe to answer the first question um, at one uh, level, we. We are developing a project which is called uh, Wallonie Compétences d'Avenir. It's a uh, body um, uh, composed by uh, operator or, or uh, actors of uh, professional training uh, sector. And the, their mission is to, to identify uh, current but also future needs of uh, labor markets. And uh, with uh, the main um, output is to, to, to build a, a training plan. Um, so, so, so that's very concrete. Uh, we are developing this right now, so we hope that we'll be uh, um, able to, 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 to soon uh, to soon communicate about it because it's not uh, well known. I mean, it's it's uh, it's normal. Um, I, I would like to also mention that it's more linked to to the French speaking community. But um, um, Minister Jean-Claude Marcourt, so the, the former uh, um, Minister of Enseignement um, Supérieur, um, higher education, yeah, yeah, higher education um, build what we call um, collective structure for uh, higher education. And within those structures, um, the companies can uh, tell the, the universities or and um, uh, training bodies, okay, we need those types of profiles right now. Um, and then the, 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 the training bodies as the and the as the have the mission, sorry, to to, to be able to give the, the training um, to give the companies the profile they they, they need. Uh, for the, the question of uh, urgency in Belgium, um, yeah. <laughs> but uh, a good point is that the regional government are quickly implemented uh, generally. And uh, we, so what I hear from today, but also what I knew before, is the, the will to, to collaborate uh, between uh, regional uh, governments. So, well, even if the federal level is not implemented, we are here. And we are there, and we want to to work together. So it's um, a kind of good positive signal uh, towards the uh, abroad, and I think it's very important. Um, but also the, the attractivity of of Belgian territory and uh, specifically each region is very important because we are working on attractivity um, towards the the companies. Uh, which is, as Gregory said, uh, the, the job of uh, uh, Minister of Economics most of the time. Um, but attractivity for workers is also very important. Uh, you mentioned taxes, and yeah, it's very important if a worker uh, can um, can have a, a salary, but half of the salary is is composed of taxes. Maybe we'll think twice before coming to to Belgium. Um, so yeah, it's uh, another uh, aspect of attractivity we need to to tackle. And I think that that's my personal point of view. That you are right. Uh, maybe the 
the, the focus is too much on, not too much, but it's clinically on the companies, but should be uh, put also on the workers uh, individually. Thank you. Um, I will start with the question of Igor, a link to Europe. Um, I agree. Um, since there is a sense of urgency, um, we, uh, we, we are with uh, three regions. Um, it's not uh, easy to, um, to draft a legislation. You have to negotiate with federal government. We have to negotiate with the social partners, etc. But we are doing our best. Of course, um, I really want to uh, stress uh, a thing. So we are talking about economic migration today. Uh, migration is a very sensitive topic. It's not easy to um, to to draft a legislation and say, hey, we're going to attract uh, third country nationals to, uh, to 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 Flanders or to the other regions, and uh, we're going to do this and that. It's, you have to negotiate about it. You have to make migration a positive uh, story, um, and um, we're, we're doing our best, and that takes time, of course. Um, there are other factors uh, for th third country nationals to choose for uh, Belgium or for the region. So uh, the tax landscape is already mentioned. You have uh, uh, the, the, the popularity of some universities. So we have Cal Leuven, which is very popular. So people um, who want to do, start to study here, maybe they will stay here in, in Flanders and start a company or uh, work as uh, an employee. Um, the procedure of family reunification is also very important to stress because we want to attract uh, talent, but we also want to 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 sustain them, to to uh, to build uh, their families here. So, is it possible for them to uh, bring their family here? Is it possible for uh, the partner to uh, start a company here? Um, so, there are a lot of factors to um, take account, and um, it's it's you have to make it a positive story. So. Uh, that's um, that's the keyword. Um, the second question of the lady. Um, yes. So we have in Flanders a, dy a dynamic list of the strict structural shortage occupations. Um, it exists of 20 professions and it's um, reviewed two yearly. It's re reviewed with the, our partner VDAB and also with the social partners. So. Um, but there's also uh, the idea to review the list yearly, um, but that, that has to uh, be discussed. Um, so there is an interaction with the social partners and uh, with the VIB, of course. Uh, the last question about the skilled observatory centers. Um, my, uh, I concentrate on economic migration as a lawyer, so I do not concentrate on activating people, et cetera, et cetera but I think it's uh, VDAB who's uh, responsible uh, to do all this. We have a lot of projects that are running. We have the lifelong learning that my colleague has mentioned. We have um, the recognition of competences, uh, people who do not have uh, uh, a diploma. Uh, we, they can start here. Um, uh, you have people who have a, a diploma, a higher uh, degree, but they have to get the recognition by NARIC, Flanders, so it takes a while. So we're looking for a, a faster a way to, uh, to attract uh, those talents. Um, I think I'm done. Thank you. Well, let's take a, a last round of questions. Also, the people that are following online, they can use the chat function in the webinar. Uh, in case they would want to uh, raise questions as well. Maybe you really want to react one second here yeah, and then throw it to the audience. <laughs> well, I, I just wanted to react to, uh, to Brigitte's question, to, to Ms. Arendt's question on the skills forecasting. Uh, I think that uh, every region gave examples on how they're working on skills forecasting, but I lack the, the future uh, future forecasting, in fact, because what we are doing is we are analyzing the actual needs on the labor market. And then we put procedures in place, and then they take uh, one year and a half before we are able to, to react. And of course, the needs, meanwhile, already changed. Huh? So I, 
I'm sorry for for that remark, but but I, I think I'm 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 right. So I think that on a European level, we should do a good skills forecasting analysis, of course based on artificial intelligence, not based on only uh, people's thoughts. And there we should really look into the the, the further future skills, uh, five to ten years, and then we should present those kinds of reports. To draw your own um, uh, specific priorities and, and, and to, to put them into, in, into place. I give an example. By 2027, linked to the Green Deal in Belgium, there will be it will be obliged to, to renovate houses. So we will need a lot more civil engineers by then. But we do not realize that those civil engineers will have to enroll next academic year to have their, their degree by 2027. So the urgency, we're not, we're, we're not always anticipating. I think that on a European level, we should come with an, an, an anticipation with, with a skills forecast that's a little uh, faster than the, than the structured bodies we, we already know. Thank you very much, Erun. Um, I'm going to give the floor back to the audience now, so just maybe to speed up a bit, introduce yourself and maybe also indicate who are you asking the question to, so that we can indeed uh, speed up this last round of, uh, of questions. There were some questions on this side. If we are out of time, I will be short. Uh, just uh, to add to this uh, um, observatory a question is that there are also local initiatives like um, uh, there is this uh, project from Interreg between Flanders and Holland it's called Skills Navigator and it's uh, it's focused on, on Ghent, the city of Ghent is, is, uh, is one of the main partners and it's focused on the port of Ghent so we are also not, not waiting for what is happening on, on, on national or regional level but uh, also on local level to see what the, the companies really need there uh, in, in that sector. And secondly, I just wanted to ask in this concentric uh, model if these inactive persons are job seekers or also people that have never worked and are not registered even with VDMB, because that's a big difference. Um, if you look at the, the, the last category, it will take much more than 12 to 4, 24 uh, months to skill them and, and even convince them to start taking part on uh, and having a job, so that was my question. So that's why I think we have a, a, we need a parallel circuit of ne um, next to the people that are in our country to look certainly at also the third countries. Okay, you want to answer that rapidly? Hello, I'm Lenka Kint, I'm from VDAB, and I can answer your last question. Uh, of course, um, uh, everybody says it, we don't have enough labor force uh, nowadays in, uh, in Flanders, in Belgium, and also in, in Europe. The shortages are coming up. Um, and in, at VDAB, what we are doing is trying to uh, find ways to activate people that are not registered at VDAB, just like you said. Uh, if you are a job seeker, it's of course easier because we have all the data of such these people. We can write them, we can activate them, uh, discuss with them the possibilities they can have with this new labor market. Uh, but for activating people that are not registered at VDIB, uh, that's a little bit more difficult because you have to join them. You have to find them. We know now because we are uh, doing, we are studying this already for more than one year. We know then now that a lot of these people are eager to go to work. So it's not our goal to force them to work, just to motivate them to work. But a lot of these people want to work, but they don't know how to start with it. And this is now the next point that we will try to tackle at video. Thank you. We have I see one other question there. Thank you very much. Uh, first, I would like to present myself. I'm Lidon Dolanos. I'm the new special envoy on migration and asylum in the Federal Ministry of Foreign Affairs. 
And for those who have known Jean-Luc Botsou, I'm replacing him from 1st of September this year. So I'm still new on the on the on the on the, on the topic. So uh, I'm trying to learn. And this this uh, this uh, uh, kickoff meeting helps a lot on 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 the whole theme of labor migration. I say. I have I read a few questions. Um, uh, first one is a, is is a simple question of information. Uh, when when for example from uh, Jamila talks about 10,000 work permits. Uh, do we have a ge geographical distribution of, of where the people come from? Uh, also for the other regions, if we talk about third countries at this moment, what kind of countries are we talking mostly about? And especially, for example, what what is the part of Africa in it, which is interesting for us. Um, Secondly, uh, on, on policy development, every region is now uh, developing its own policy on labor migration. My question is how far this can be done autonomously and, and, then, and then how far European policy is steering that. So what are the margins for every region to fill in its own policy? Uh, and third one is the question to Jeroen. It struck me that he um, answered one of the two problems that were mentioned often uh, with, with regard to labor and migration, the one on social security, but it didn't, he didn't give an answer on the remark on on, on everything is what is brain drain. So, so, and that is of course in our, uh, we are also looking in our service on, on the whole link between migration and development. And that's an important question and, and a question that needs an answer also, I think for the future. So, so what are, are his ideas on that? If I, if I may, I, I don't have all the answers, of course, so I'm sorry for not answering that question. But I think that this, um, that this combination of, of hybrid working with a project in, actually, oh, sorry, okay. I think that, um, that the link with the country of origin uh, has to stay. Uh, this could be project-based, of course. Huh? So we, we discussed on it uh, earlier. Why not work for a Belgian employer uh, four days and work uh, one day on a project in your uh, in your home home country? In fact, I think that um, guaranteeing the proximity with your land of origin is essential, both for the well-being or the prosperity of the original country and for the the idea that we're not that, that we as a region or as a country are not stealing the brains uh, there I, I think that from a CSR level or from a from a um, uh, ethical level we should take that really into account thank you and we will come back also on the brain doing question in the next session so it will be uh, discussed there as well. Maybe a question from the webinar audience now, and then I go back to the to the panelists. Yeah, thank you. We have a, a question from um, the, a colleague from Bessy, and this is directed to, to you, Gregory Frank. Uh, actually, um, the question uh, is uh, about uh, the new uh, regional legal framework that you that you mentioned. Uh, if you could unveil some more specific details. And in particular, enlighten us uh, about uh, the, the work permit rules and whether actually this new legal framework will be aligned with uh, the legal frameworks uh, that are already in place in the two other regions. Thank you. Well, so I think now I give the floor back to the to the panel. We can start with the last question and then we go through for the uh, for the other ones. Yeah. Uh, for now, we are working on uh, the reform, and uh, we haven't had uh, any discussion with the government and, and so on, so it's difficult to, to say what uh, it will be. Um, but for sure, we are looking at the two other regions. Um, we will be maybe the last region to, to implement the, the a real uh, reform. At least uh, Flanders is uh, already a few steps uh, before us. So uh, we are looking on it, but uh, for sure we have not the same labor market and, and so on. So it can be a uh, difference, but we will try uh, our best, uh, as always uh, in Brussels, to 
uh, align with um, the two other regions when it's possible. It's not always possible, but when it's, it's possible, we want to to align with that. So, um, but but like I said, uh, we want more predictability for the job shortage. So we want to work on with with a list, but not only with a list. Uh, and we want to uh, attract a more high profile. Um, the idea of the, the solution of Flanders of uh, getting the, the wage limits uh, lower for uh, young diplomies or graduate, it's, uh, it's an option. Uh, for example, um, maybe uh, the COVID crisis can change it as we see that uh, young graduates uh, in Brussels will be maybe the, the first victim. So um, maybe that can change the, the view, uh, the first view that we had. So, it's difficult to, to say now what would be the, the, the big lines of the big difference, but we want to, to simplify, we want to, to, to go faster, and maybe like uh, in uh, Holland or other countries to introduce a good company level, uh, not to go faster because we are already going fast, but maybe to reduce some uh, administrative uh, work for uh, companies when we never have a problem with them. Uh, in, in long term, because we have, uh, I think, 8,000 uh, uh, permits in Brussels. It's also 90% uh, of uh, highly qualified with uh, uh, companies that are based here, and we never have problems. So maybe we can um, reduce some administrative, um, um, yeah, for them. So we will see. It's difficult to say no, but uh, the vision is really to, to, to try to simplify, to go faster and to be more attractive for high profile. So the salary was uh, one, the, the predictability of the, the, the job shortage and the needs of companies can be uh, another one. Maybe someone on the other questions, the first two of... To answer the first question um, for... Um... I didn't remember your name, but you're replacing Jean-Luc the because I have worked with him in the past. Um, so we have uh, delivered 8,000 work permits for highly skilled profiles. Um, India is one of the countries. I do not have the list with me, so I cannot uh, explain uh, and give you all the countries, but there are also some African countries, like Morocco. Um, but I can provide you the list if you're interested. And I think the second question, um, I did not get that well. What was the second question between the European Union and the region? The link with policy you are developing and the, the policy of the European Union as a whole. What are, what are the margins you have mm -hmm. to develop? Um, so, um, the Flemish region has uh, supported another uh, migration project in the past, it's the Bali project, uh, so uh, it's about um, giving a chance to uh, Moroccan uh, uh, citizens to work here as an IT -er. Um, we have um, we are we agreed with uh, supporting the project, but it has to be in line with the uh, Flemish policy. That means that we have to get a competitive salary. Um, it's only for um, for the highly skilled, so to fill in the gaps for the highly skilled profiles. Um, but it's very important to stress that we are looking for talent, so we do not want to focus on um, nationality. So we welcome all talents. To uh, work on our labor market. I think to conclude, maybe I think yeah, the single permit, the European framework is yeah, you can't get anything of it, but it's a base, and according next to that, the authorities, the regional level, have some additional elements um, that are not um, yeah ruled by European government, and uh, so I think there is some margin, but not the, the, the big margin, um, because a lot of um, the stuff is um, regulated by uh, the European directive, uh, which is binding, of course. Um, I see one more hand, maybe one more question, and then to conclude. Okay, but let's keep it very short then. Uh, 
Um, hello, my name is Stefan Persman. I'm member of the, um, I'm working for ACV and I'm member of the Commission of Labour Migration of Flanders. Um, we talk all the time about high skilled people, but we do have a list of 21 um, professions of practical skills like butchers uh, and, and or, 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 or or, um, or, 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 yeah, or, or people working working in factories. I mean, we do even we have a shortage on low skills, but this board this is completely closed. But we do have migrants here who can work, who can take up the work. What's the policy to practical skills workers in the region? Because that's even a more. I, I think you can convince um, the society. Um, we need high skilled people, but we also do need practical skilled people. And what's the policy on that? Wants to take this one? Thank you for the question. Um, in Wallonia, we developed uh, bodies uh, called, uh, I have to make a translation, uh, Regional Center for Integration of Foreign People. Um, there are desks concretely where uh, foreign people can can present themselves and say, okay, I'm looking for a job or, or uh, somewhere to, um, I don't know, a place to live. Um, and then um, following the, 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 what they are looking for, they are redirected to another body. So for employment, which is the main topic of, of today, um, they will be redirected to a training center or to a forum. Um, and then they will be able to 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 apply for a, a job such as a butcher or or working in a factory as you mentioned um and so that's not uh, a new policy but um the effectiveness of uh, those uh, those centers is really important for us um and we are we, our goal is to 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 reinforce them and to give them the the the, the the power or the, the ability to 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 redirect 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 people uh, the most efficiency um, way and that's what we're doing in Romania. I hope I, I answer your, your question more or less. I can. Migration of third nationals, not what we do here. Yeah, but I, I mean, uh, third country people coming in Belgium. Uh, first of all, I think he's looking for a place to live, uh, to sleep, and then and then the work. Um, so I think those centers are really important to to help those people to to contribute to our economy, to our system, and to to give them the opportunity to integrate themselves in, in Belgium. I don't know if my colleague wants. To... Okay, but I think we're running out of time, so we can also continue yeah. this discussion in the Q&A on the next session. So, thanks a lot, uh, David, for moderating. Thanks a lot to the panelists for your contributions. Uh, very interesting. Um, and I suggest that we immediately move to the next uh, panel. And I ask Lenka from the DAB to come forward. She's the moderator for the next uh, panel. So thank you everybody. Uh, good, almost good afternoon, good meeting, good noon, like you say in Flemish. Uh, like I said, my name is Lenka Kins. I'm a strategic account manager, international relations at CDFD. And in my position, I have to follow up on all the migration pilot projects that CDIB is uh, dealing with. Uh, I want now to introduce you Rob. You know Rob already. You saw him speaking, moving, but maybe you don't know the details of his life. So here they are coming. Your background, Rob, is uh, in business economics, and you have 17 years of hands-on experience in project management. 
Uh, in February 2018, it started to become interesting for us today mm -hmm. because then, at that moment, he joined the International Organization for Migration based in Brussels. And already in 2018, they told me, because I didn't know, uh, you, you started heading, of course, the Labour and uh, Human Development Unit of the Country Office for Belgium and Luxembourg, and you directly initiated the idea of setting up a labour migration scheme between Africa and the European Union with private sector partners. Tell me if it's not true. Uh -huh. What are you doing today? I know it also, I will tell you. You are coordinating the implementation of the MATCH project together with the project team. And so, kind of, you are coordinating me. Uh -huh. So I leave now the floor to you and you will present the MATCH project uh -huh. in detail. Thank you, Lenka, for this very beautiful introduction. Um, I think we've touched upon a lot of things already this morning, you know, uh, related to the MATCH project, so I hope I will be able to save some time. Um, I will just give you an overview of what MATCH is about. There's a lot of uh, details and specificity, but I will not go into uh, every single uh, detail. The first slide that I wanted to show is uh, related to the countries that are involved, but we've already touched upon that. Um, the uh, four European countries are the Benelux countries and Italy, the north of Italy uh, in particular, and the two uh, African countries that we're working with are Senegal and Nigeria. If we then look at why did we choose these two African countries, there's a number of reasons uh, for that. Uh, obviously, we have one French-speaking country and one English-speaking country, yeah, which uh, when you look at the European countries involved could be, you know, handy. Um, but there's another, uh, there's a set of other criteria, and I just made a short summary here of uh, what we looked into. Obviously, we were looking into countries with a political and economic stability uh, for the obvious reasons. Um, we were definitely looking into countries where there's a quantitative availability of uh, labor. Uh, we, we talked about brain drain uh, today. Um, the idea indeed is not to set up a brain drain and to go and you know, convince people that are needed in these countries or maybe already have a job in these countries to step out of that and come uh, to Europe. No, we were looking at an offer, you know, that is abundant. Eh? And we're looking at more specifically, generally, at younger people, very often people that are not employed yet. Um, but, okay, the, 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 the scope was let's look for countries where there is indeed sufficient quantitative uh, offer obviously combined with the quality of education. So we wanted also to have a look at, um, you know, what are the universities like, what are the schools like. When we talk about the sectors in need on the European side, can this, can this match, you know, with some of the offers that exist on the, on the African side. So the quality obviously was also important. And then lastly, uh, the presence of strong partners. And as you know, uh, we are working in the African countries with uh, the employment agencies, and so the equivalent of uh, the VDAB here in Belgium on the uh, African side. Um, and we are working with uh, our IOM offices, obviously, but also with uh, 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 private organizations that are uh, supporting us. So those elements are important for us in the assessment of the potential of uh, the uh, African uh, continent and the African uh, countries. How does it work? Yes, the match project, how does it work? So I think you can maybe immediately put the entire slide. So the idea is indeed that the companies on the European uh, side uh, give the input, give our starting point for the match project. So they come to us with vacancies and we want to be really demand driven. Uh, and so we need to know what our company is looking for in terms of uh, profile. So we ask, we invite the companies today Please join us, please come and talk to us and explain, you know, what your needs are in the short run, but also in the medium and in the long run. These vacancies are then through our network and our partners published in Senegal and Nigeria. And the idea there is that indeed some candidates are pre-selected. Right? So we have a selection panel in these two African countries, and we will come up with a pre-selected set of candidates that match as good as possible the vacancies on the European side. So we, we, we are able at this stage to tell companies we will bring you a top five, you know, the best matches that we found in these two African countries, we will bring it to you. 
uh, and we can uh, and you can then you know take it further from there look into this top five uh, organize a recruitment maybe some testing whatever your procedures are in your company you are then free to do um, uh, as you wish in terms of procedure with this top five that we can uh, provide to you the match project facilitates this whole process as you see we are in dialogue with the regional and national authorities uh, we are working on the logistics and we will be training both the, the migrants the labor uh, force but also the companies if they would uh, wish wish so a few words on the benefits for companies you know to participate in match i think the first thing that I want to say is that the costs for companies are low. So when I mentioned this top five that we can bring for every vacancy in these four European countries, that is at no cost. So the match project can really provide that at no cost and say, look, here are five individuals, have a look at them and let us know whether you're interested, you know, in potentially hiring some of these uh, people. We are obviously looking into qualified professionals and with the team that we have constituted today, uh, we are indeed, uh, our vision is indeed to match as much as possible um, the, the qualifications that are required uh, from the company side. We are very flexible and we are obliged a little bit due to COVID to be even more flexible and creative. So we say yes, uh, there is a possibility indeed to, uh, to hire some people. These hiring means on the short run, right? you can hire someone for a year, for two years. You can also, if you wish to uh, look into the longer term perspective. Um, we're, initially, we were imagining that this would, you know, immediately be accompanied by the physical movement of the African talents to, uh, to Europe. Today, with COVID, we had to look into that and we are looking into alternatives. And this could, for instance, be distance working. So people could start working from their home in Nigeria or Senegal for uh, European uh, companies. We will be accompanying the companies that are, that are part of the match projects also with the diversity at the workplace strategies. And this is something that is important also in the private sector here uh, in Belgium in particular. So we are setting up a number of trainings on intercultural competence, on ethical recruitment, et cetera. So all topics related to the match uh, mobility scheme. And then obviously we hope that through the match project, the companies will also um, you know, be enabled to discover the potential of the African labor market because Africa all uh, together. Uh, maybe add here that we will be uh, joining also uh, the economic mission of Belgium to Senegal, which was foreseen, uh, I believe in June uh, this year, uh, and it's postponed now due to COVID to next year. So that's uh, the, the royal mission with, uh, with our princess to, to Senegal that we will be joining together with a number of Belgian companies. And I believe that for next year, there's also a plan uh, to go on a mission to, uh, to Nigeria. So that's really a mission where with the companies together with them, we can go and look at the potential of these two African countries. What is expected from the employer? So that's also a question that we very often get. Now the audience today are not only uh, employers, so I will go through it uh, quite rapidly. We've talked about the employment conditions. We've talked about the single permit. We've talked about the fact that there's conditions related to the single permit with regards to salary, et cetera. So that's important to, uh, to put here. Um, we expect indeed, it's a bit implicit, but obviously we, we expect the companies to invest in human capital. And so we really think that the company should also make some time, you know, to train these people, to bring them into their teams, to integrate them, uh, etc. We expect that the companies uh, give us feedback on what is happening. So once they have employed someone, we as the match team, we will be monitoring what is happening. So we will be asking questions to the companies, but also to the African talents to see, like, how is it going, you know? What about your expectations? Is it, you know, meeting your expectations? Are there things, you know, that should be improved? Are there interventions that we could do, you know, to uh, facilitate things, etc.? So there's a whole monitoring and assistance, uh, you know, um, uh, task for us included in the project. And we expect the companies indeed to take some time to give us once in a while some feedback on how things are uh, going with their uh, African talents. And then indeed, I think Jeroen has also mentioned it earlier, we are hoping to connect these young African talents to, for instance, diaspora communities that are already established uh, here in Belgium. So 
the Senegalese, the Nigerian community. We are hoping to connect these newcomers, let's say, to these communities and eventually also have them contribute to some of the initiatives that these uh, diaspora communities are having or launching back in Senegal and uh, Nigeria. So as you understand, we try to, you know, keep this link with the country of origin. We try to, you know, have these people contribute to possibly interesting initiatives that are at the benefit of uh, the two African countries. But the overall mechanism here as well is that we are talking about job placements. So in principle, this would, this would be fixed term contracts. Um, and it's really, um, the, the, the principle of the project is really that the, 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 the companies and the migrants, if they both agree after, for instance, a job placement of one year that they continue together, that is obviously possible. Nevertheless, if they do not uh, agree to continue together, then the idea is also that the, the, the African talents go back to their country of origin. So the idea is not that they would all of them come to Europe and stay here permanently. Uh, we are convinced that a lot of them will be going back um, and, and then will, you know, integrate the economies of their country uh, of origin. Sometimes through, you know, the network that they have built here, sometimes working still for the company, you know, that has hired them, but then back uh, in the, on the African uh, continent. So that's also for us one of the issues when, we, when we're confronted with discussion on brain drain is yes, we need to keep this in mind and also we need to somehow connect all these dots so that there is also a very clear return for the country of origin. Uh, when these people return with increased skills, with increased employability, with maybe a network, etc., we need to monitor also what is going to happen with these people once they return. And we, we know from previous projects, and we will come to that a bit later, that indeed uh, the effects can be uh, quite uh, positive. To conclude, our team in Belgium, but I think you've met everybody today. Um, so Jeroen was here, Daphne is sitting there, Davy was here, Els is sitting there, uh, Lenka we've just heard, Vincent is here uh, on the slide also representing the, the, the Brussels region. So these are the people that are working in Belgium on this match uh, initiative just putting them there so that you get the, uh, the full overview. You see also for which organizations they are uh, working. And then I think uh, I conclude with just a, a word on the information that we have available online. We have a leaflet that looks like this. We have a website that is mentioned here. We also have a LinkedIn page uh, where we you know, post the development of what is going on in the match project. So I all invite you to or go visit our website, take our leaflets uh, back home, or become a member of our LinkedIn page so that you can follow up on what is actually happening within uh, the match project. Well, I think as a summary, I will leave it here. Um, I'm happy to take uh, questions, or the questions are Lenka for later on, yes. So I give the floor back to, uh, to Lenka. Okay. I invite you, François Lebrun. I don't know how we will sit. Shall we sit there? Maybe it's easier, yes. All right. Thank you, there. With social distancing, of course. So, Francois, I'm very pleased to see you for real today because we had already a, a short chat on the phone. Um, I know that you are the CEO of a company called IML. Can you tell me what you, your company is doing? What are the activities are of the company? Oh, yes, I, I'm actually the, the CEO of many companies. I have, uh, put some money in 14 different companies startup most of the time. Some of them are, are taking care of software for banks and insurance companies here in Europe, for example, Argenta or AXA in Belgium. And we produce a whole lot of uh, software and uh, data mining and things like that. So um, we have something like 100 people in the world working for us. So we are an extremely small company, 100 is not that much. But uh, well, so uh, mainly insurance bank and uh, business data database business. That's what we are. So if I understand well, you are you are doing the IT part. You are helping the banks and yes. if, uh, okay. 
So that's good. I heard that you are already involved in some uh, projects with IOM, and I'm wondering why are the reasons for you to hire a co third country national through a labor mobility scheme? Why don't you do it just like that? What's the difference? Oh, there's many, many questions. The difference is it was a pleasure to have people from another country. Uh, those guys had uh, different views on what we are doing. It was helping us to open also an office in Tunis. And uh, now we have, um, I think, 37 people in Tunis, thanks to that. So it was really helping us to open there. And also, some of them were wishing to stay with us. It was a bit more difficult for technical reasons. So, uh, for the moment, they are just working with us through, uh, through the web. So, uh, they are working from Tunis uh, for the Bundle Company. Uh, but it was really so, sort of a wake up you know, situation. It was a pleasure to have them. They have another um, a view on what we are doing. They had a great idea for Tunisia, for Africa. So for us, we win a whole lot. Uh, we are, as I said, small company, and we saw great guys, extremely young, with new ideas, who are willing to do business of things, extremely, extremely positive guys. So for us, it was extremely good. And uh, thanks to them, we have now a nice app in Africa. So uh, thanks also to all the teams there, we, we succeed to do that because there was a a huge work of, of choosing those guys in Tunis, uh, your colleagues Muna, and then when they were here, Nelson, and, and you, you, you've done a great job to succeed this business, and now we are, we are working on it. But you've done way more than me, so you <laughs> Thank you, uh, Francois. So, so for the audience to, to understand, so Francois indeed has participated in a similar project in the past uh, between uh, Belgium and uh, Tunisia. Um, and a question I had for you, Francois, is, when you heard about this project uh, and the possibility indeed to hire, you know, some of these young African talents, what was the trigger for you to say, yes, um, this is something I want to try? Because a lot of people, organizations, companies are a bit reluctant, right? They think like, but why should I, you know, hire young Africans, you know, can I not just, you know, continue business as usual? So my question is, indeed, you know, you you took that step, you know, you took that risk, if you want, uh, to 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 try it. What was the trigger that said, yeah, maybe I need to, maybe maybe I need to look into this, right? It's a it's a question where you will have a strange answer <laughs> because in fact there was absolutely no reason. We we are a company where we believe that we have to say yes, you know, and most of the people are saying no all the time. I don't know if you realize that in Europe. We are old lady who say always say no. Extremely rich old lady who say no. If I have to summarize uh, Europe, and we are a young uh, company, and so we say yes. Mm -hmm. And so people were coming with this idea of oh great, let's try it, let's do it. Okay, if it doesn't work, okay, we will see what, what will happen. And then we meet people who are extraordinary to organize. So we were extremely and stressed by doing it, because initially we said, what's going on? Seven people coming, who are they? What do they expect from us? And um, different people from Tunis came. We saw the way that they were working to, to choose the different guys. And it was extremely professional. It was infeasible for a small company to reach that level. So, so the yes was, yes, 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 let's go. And then uh, you, you, you say something extremely right. There were uh, new opportunities to, to open something over there, because increasing the wish to go there. And, and uh, so we, we are really thankful for, for this job you've done. But it was first, why not? Let's go. You know, we don't wish to say yes. Uh, no, it's always something you miss. Yeah. <laughs> I like it a lot that you are so open. Yeah, I agree with you that the no in, uh, in Europe is very often the, the only problem. And it's a mistake. Yeah, it's a mistake. Uh, but still, when you were hiring these uh, young people from Tunis, you have uh, differences maybe in, in knowledge, maybe in competences. They have maybe another view on education than we have. So how did you tackle this? How did you do organize the, the knowledge transfer and also 
What did you do with the maybe the cultural differences that you encountered in your company? Well, I'm an ICT company, so there's really no no difference how you you, you work on ICT. I, I think I've been lucky to be in that kind of business. Um, the most um, uh, the biggest difference was. Uh, Wine, beer, and water. You know, we were not drinking the same thing. So, uh, uh, Belgium is known for beer. So, when you go in a Muslim country, you, you, you lose a whole lot. I don't know, and remember who said that Belgium has to be more known. It's so, so you are yeah, right. I think it's you, sir. You're so right. Okay. We are known for nothing when you go in, in Africa. Uh, some people know beer, but when you go, as I say, in a Muslim country, uh, you are better off to 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 put the chocolate. In. But um, um, uh, nobody knows Belgium, and, and, oh. and we have absolutely to succeed to say that we are the place to be for for IT guys. That we are a wonderful country, safe country. Well, if you have any problem? You have doctors, medicine. It's a wonderful country. We have every time we say it's it's a, it's. A, uh, I don't wish to go to the state. I don't wish to go to my wife. She's German, so I have to say that I agree to go to Germany. But uh, except that, Belgium and Germany is so great, such a lovely place. And people, when they come and visit our country, they really believe it's the best place to live. They're extremely happy. And then most of the time they're homesick, and some of them are really, really helping, asking to go back. We we had one guy who said, "Okay, me, I'm homesick. The weather is so." So, so difficult. It was winter time. It was snowing, and uh, well, Tunis is of course the weather is so so nice. And so, um, most of the people thought the country is beautiful, wonderful, green. Uh, um, you you have all the access to train, uh, airplanes. You can uh, travel for free everywhere. It's it's a it's a pleasure to be here. But uh, somebody said tax problem. I really don't think it's a problem. A tax problem is no, nothing. You have so much. Okay, you can go to the university for free. You can go to so many things for free. You have health problem. You have somebody who is helping you, and then you have to fulfill the problem. You, you no, nope, it's one for that. And so you pay a bit of tax. But people, when they wish to come to Belgium, they first say, um, "University are they great?" Because I wish to go to a place where the level will be. That high, like that, I will learn. And the, 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 they have question of that. So one guy was asking, is it far away from from uh, uh, Disneyland? Because I really wish to, to go there. So yeah, no problem. We will buy a train and go there, buy a ticket train. So the question I never tax. I never heard someone saying, I will not come because there's tax. But one guy was wishing to go to Paris, and we say, you're mad. You will live in a small room. Being a rent was huge. Don't go there. And uh, voila, we had the pleasure to have him for a few, 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 few weeks. But um, I wish to say also that talents in Africa, you don't have that many. You have a big, big, big future. Um, uh, you see, all those countries wish to, wish to catch them. Okay. You have um, Canada who is coming and asking people to come. You have um, South, South America. You have Europe, you have many countries who are coming, say, just come. So you don't have that many guys. Um, for the moment, nevertheless, they look okay. We can find nice, nice guys. But it's getting more and more complex. I had a guy who went to Canada. I was extremely sad, but he went there because for many reasons. There was another guy asking to come or to Belgium or to France. Unfortunately, it was not fast enough. And so he went to France, so it was just for a technical reason. I was, I was so sad that just for a technical reason, because he didn't have the, the documents fast enough, he decided to go to... to. But you see, it's a, it's a war. It's not that easy to catch them, to ask them to come. Um, um, I will be delighted to work with you with those two new countries, expecting that a whole lot of people will come and work with us, <laughs> maybe go back, and it will be the opportunity to have a new you office over there, so I'm extremely happy to 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 hear that you will do it again. I will be with you definitely, but um, uh, it's getting more and more complex to have the great guy. So we need more publicity for Brussels. We need uh, good chocolate to to have them with us. We need a whole lot of things. But taxi. Okay. So, uh, 
don't think it's really the point. Maybe I'm, you're not okay with me, but I never heard someone saying, uh, uh, I will not come in. There's too many taxing buses. They don't know where Belgium is. Come on. <laughs> Thank you. So, so, so my understanding is correct that today you are still working with some of these people that, that have come to Belgium? Three of them in Tunis. Okay. And one guy who is in the, three of them in Tunis. They're great guys. One is now in Canada. He called me saying, how can we open an office in Canada? I said, well, yeah, well, <laughs> let's think about it. So, yeah, we, we have nice contacts. And we had seven people and three are still. We're talking about highly skilled labor here. So one of the questions that I also had was, if you would now have to compare, you know, the technical skills of these people, these young African talents with their equivalents in Belgium, let's say, yeah, with someone who has the same diploma, you know, who has the same background, how would you compare that? Because we always get this question like, yes, but, you know, what can these people do, you know, at what level can be situated? Most people have no experience at all with these African countries. So it's a very good question, I think, also from a lot of companies like, yeah, I'm a bit reluctant because I don't know what I will get. So I think it's an important question also, and maybe you, from your experience, can answer. Where do you situate these people, you know, on that scale, you know? Um, are they as skilled as their Belgian equivalents, or are there any differences there? Ah. Ah, it's again a tough one. Huh? And I thought you are my friends, but uh, <laughs> and I'm not sure anymore. But um, you know, when you, you leave um, at the university here in Belgium, uh, your level is between zero and 100. Because, uh, and it's really linked with my business, huh? uh, ICT. Well, yeah, you go to university, you, you learn a couple of things. Most of the time, it's things who are not uh, real anymore. It's theoretical stuff. Uh, and um, then you have a couple of guys who are completely mad about software and they are great. You know? They are guys that you really wish because they have a level, incredible level. And they've learned that level not really from the university. Um, I've noticed that those young guys who, who make such a big jump, okay, they, they, they're really leaving the family and so on. They have so much wish that most of the time they're close to 100, okay? But most of the time it's not coming from a good uh, university, good degree, because it's more afterward your wish to, to really spend your life in front of the computer. You know, it's extremely difficult to create something from nothing, being facing a, a computer. By the way, I'm so happy to have a real meeting I mean, those guys are real. I had always the Zoom of things like that for the last uh, six months. So, uh, are you really real? I'm happy that you are. So, 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 so many people are here. I'm glad to physically finally see someone. I'm happy about that. But so, so um, uh, I think they are extremely positive, and education is good. But it's really the fact they are they're dreaming. That, yeah, the attitude that. <laughs> so that's a very good message towards our uh, employers, of course, and I'm looking at uh, <laughs> Davy. Um, so most of the level of education is because they are passionate by their job. Yeah, okay, that's a very good one. Uh, a discussion that we quite often have uh, in Flanders is about uh, what is best to organize circular migration which is the goal of this project, for example. They stay here for one year, for two years, and then they go back. But other people are saying, no, it's better that they stay in Belgium, that they can remain here with their families. The kids are learning our language, and it's traumatized to go back to their country. I don't know. So what is your meaning about this? Is it better to work with circular migration, or? Oh. <laughs> oh, um. Uh, I will tell you, I will be able to tell you exactly what's going on in 10 years, okay? Um, as much as I've seen, uh, most of the guys, uh, they, they were extremely young, so there was not really a point of family. They, they were just coming, um, appreciating, uh, taking a few, few months, a few years with us. They were extremely happy to do that. It was a wonderful experience for them. Some of them were homesick. I think it's like that, you, you, it's extremely difficult to know who will be and why. And so um, it's difficult from the first day to say this guy will stay that much and then he will go back. I think it's technical 
but it's not practical. Um, as I say, my wife is German, my kids are speaking German, we've been living in Ireland, we are now in Brussels, we, we, we have three or four languages, they are, they are learning Dutch. Uh, We've been a bit everywhere. My father was working for the European Commission. We've been also a bit everywhere. I'm okay, you know. So I don't think it's a drama. To you. I think it's extremely extraordinary, um, um, something extremely positive. I, I've been so happy to, to travel everywhere with my father. I hope um, uh, my kids in 20 years will be here and will tell you the same. As far as I know, they are extremely happy to have this multi multicultural situation. They come with me in Tunis. They see things who are incredible for them. For them. So it was 14 today, so uh, she's a young girl, but uh, extremely open to everything. And um, for me, I'm so happy that she's joining me in those countries. So I think it's different, uh, no, no, it's definitely opening the mind of uh, the kids and uh, hardly, um, I try to find a counter example, but I, I don't think I want uh, Thank you. I, I see we have like six, seven minutes left uh, before 12. Um, except if you, if you wanted to ask something else, I, I would suggest that we maybe uh, give the floor to the audience. I see that there's also questions definitely from uh, the webinar. So let me bring you the microphone. So uh, the, the participants uh, would be very interested to have more details about the matching system that we will use uh, uh, in the match project. So how are we going to actually select those, uh, those young talents? Thank you. Yeah, I can briefly just um, answer that question. And so the, uh, the, the, the answer in one sentence is that the company will uh, be the ones that decide on who to recruit or not to recruit. So as I explained, the match project will provide the five best matches according to a vacancy, and then the company takes over the responsibility. The company can decide not to hire anyone. The company can decide to hire all five of them. The company can decide to take one. The company decides on the length of the job placement. So it's really up to the company uh, you know, to look into their needs, look into, you know, will these people fit? The company can interview, obviously, these people. They can uh, make them have tests. Uh, they use their standard, you know, recruitment processes. I think uh, that's that's best. And they decide at the, at the end of that recruitment process uh, what will be the next step, right? So we have the match project. We are not recruiting. It needs to be clear that we are not the ones recruiting. We are facilitating. We are bringing people uh, to uh, the companies. But the actual recruitment is uh, done by them. Obviously, on the basis of their vacancy and the input that they give to us, we will indeed work with professionals uh, in the field to make sure that indeed these people that we will suggest are checked, double-checked, tested, uh, et cetera, uh, because obviously the whole success of this uh, project depends entirely on the quality of the matching. Um, so we're we massively investing uh, in that uh, on our side, but the actual recruitment is taking place uh, by the companies. Any other questions from the audience here or from the audience on the webinar? Yes? Maybe you can explain something more on the training, like who is providing training um, and who gives input on the uh, on the content, because the area you're working on is quite Yes, so the question is on the training and who will be providing which trainings. I think Daphne has another question in the. In the there's a follow up question from, from the, the same person saying yes, but exactly before presenting the candidates for recruitment to companies, uh, who and how are we, uh, are we going to actually pre select the, the top five candidates? Yeah, I think that's more a question for our uh, uh, professional partners, but indeed there is a selection panel that is uh, being set, you know, in the two African countries, and in that panel we have the IOM uh, local offices, we have the local employment agencies of these two uh, countries that are the equivalents of BDAB, and we have a private sector uh, recruitment expert that is established also in these uh, two countries, so that knows these countries, that knows uh, the labor market over there, etc. And so this 
selection panel is the one that will be doing the uh, selection in the, the pre-selection, I should say, in the two uh, African countries. So uh, we can we can provide you with more technical details on that. I I I, I I'm not the uh, HR expert, but um, but uh, the, if there's interest, if there's an interest from companies on that, we can definitely have a, a bilateral call on that to give you all the details um, on how this uh, exactly uh, works. On the question on the trainings. Very good question, eh? because there's a number of trainings that we provide through this project. A standardized training that everybody will go through is what we call the pre-departure orientation training. So actually, all the people that will be hired through the match project will receive a training before they leave their country of origin, before they step on the plane. Um, and within that training, we are covering a whole set uh, of things. Obviously, we're giving a lot of uh, information to them on Belgium, on the labor market in Belgium, on what to expect, etc. But we will also be training them, for instance, on uh, soft skills, yeah? because we know from the past that the uh, professional, you know, environment in which, in which they will integrate is prob probably different from what they know in their country of origin. Uh, and in order to avoid as much as possible, you know, uh, problems or friction on some of these things, we will prepare them as much as possible, you know, on uh, the uh, the professional environment that that, that, uh, that is the European one, uh, you know. In, in the past project in which you were part, there were indeed also some uh, some 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 issues related to the soft skills, and so the, those are more intangible skills. This is not knowledge. This is this is not technical skills. These are things like. The working environment, teamwork, punctuality, and deadlines, you know, all these concepts that we take for granted uh, here in, in Belgium or in Europe, just to go through all of that once again and try to prepare these people uh, as much as possible. So that's for what's the pre departure uh, orientation. Um, every uh, African talent will go through that. Then, depending on the needs, so this is not standardized, but this is more depending on the needs, we can also accompany uh, companies, especially companies that have never worked with applicants before. Um, I think it's important that indeed we also look together with them, you know, and how these people are going to be integrated. Uh, we have some trainings on uh, intercultural communication. Uh, we can also uh, assist the HR teams, you know, with um, uh, ethical recruitment uh, trainings. Uh, we, at IOM, we have developed a, a very strong ethical recruitment uh, tool, um, and so we can provide uh, that as well, uh, that information. So, but that is really on an ad hoc basis. It's, I mean, the company needs them to tell us, yes, we want this, or no, we are not really interested in this because we know what we're doing, and, and we've done this in the past. So. Uh, a lot of these uh, trainings that are available, there's trainings available to our partners as well, Agoria, Chamber of Commerce, Volta, they, they have a whole set of trainings that could be interesting, um, but that needs to be looked into, you know, uh, on a case-by-case -case basis, I would say. Any other questions? Maybe. And, um, I, I would, uh, all the people who wish to, 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 to work um, uh, with you, the AOM was doing a great job. And it's not because you're there, but <laughs> honestly, um, it was extremely simple. So um, if companies are asking themselves if they wish to do it, well, we don't even have, you don't have to say yes to everything, but they be sure that it's extremely simple. Um, be sure that I think tomorrow it will not be feasible anymore because those people will be somewhere else. Uh, be sure that uh, I'm sure that Africa is the greatest uh, country that we can work with. It's close at the same time. In fact, have many reasons to work with them, and they have many reasons to work with us. And so, we, when we have this moment in time, that when we, we are able to do it, well, don't hesitate. Just go. Okay. No risk. Only, only. Um, a great moment and interesting a link. Uh, as I say, my campaign now is in Africa, in two uh, different African countries, and it's thanks to 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 to, to you, Albert and Nelson and, and Muna. So really, uh, just go on it. Don't don't hesitate. That's perfect. Mm. I don't know what time it is, but I think these words are very very good to close. The meeting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so thank you very much, uh, Francois, for your uh, experience and for uh, everything you told us. And thank you for the audience. 
for your patience and for the fact that you are here. You are very brave. You came to Brussels with a mask, with a mask and uh, you did it all very well. Uh, I leave the floor to Rob for the very, very last person. Thank you, Lenka. Thank you for moderating. Thank you, Francois, for your testimony. And I give the floor to you, Daphne, for the concluding remarks. Thank you, uh, Rob. I think it's been a very fruitful uh, discussion. Uh, our, uh, our, our discussion in the first panel has really highlighted uh, the difficulty uh, to actually build resilient strategies to attract uh, um, qualified uh, talents. Uh, we, we do not forget actually about uh, your point about uh, lower skilled uh, uh, workers, even if, of course, within the framework of this project, we've been tackling more the highly qualified uh, uh, workers. Uh, Laura Corrado has reminded us that uh, Europe is not the favorite destination of these people, and uh, we, we really have to reflect why. Why is uh, Europe still not uh, in the in the top uh, five destination? Uh, uh, um, let's say uh, for for those uh, for those migrants. Um, I think that uh, the the answers that we got from the from the, the panelists show, of course, uh, that uh, there is awareness about the need to be more, let's say, way more proactive. But um, I would have maybe two two uh, elements to also uh, put put forward: the forecasting of skills. Uh, I think Jeroen Frensen uh, has put forward a, a brilliant idea of having a European uh, scheme. Uh, we should really reflect on that. Uh, having uh, just fragmented systems uh, is, uh, it might not be helpful in the long run. I bear in mind, of course, the complexity of Belgium as a, as a country, but, but this is uh, a very uh, important thing. Uh, moving uh, towards uh, uh, a new legal framework, a more uh, maybe a simplified also legal, legal framework, uh, I think that um, from the different observations uh, of, the, of the audience, in particular entrepreneurs that have a first-hand experience, uh, I think it would be very helpful to try to have systems that are more aligned with, uh, with each other. Uh, it's, uh, it's still quite of a maze for uh, companies, but also for individuals to find their way uh, in, uh, in this uh, system. And the last word, of course, is about uh, what we call uh, uh, in, at IOM and in the MATCH project, the win-win scenario. We should never forget that uh, we will hire young talents, we will hire people that have their own expectations. So what would be put in place in terms of uh, transfer of knowledge? What, what would be put in place in terms of also cooperation with uh, the home countries? This is what will really make those teams sustainable, but also really profitable for both sides. So uh, on these words, uh, I want you to thank you for, for your active contributions. Uh, please do not hesitate to reach out. Uh, you have our contact details now. We are very happy to, to follow uh, your, your work, uh, to, to actually engage with you concretely um, and share also some of our experience. Uh, we uh, will start the operational phase of the project uh, in the coming months, hopefully, as we have two companies interested to join us. So it will be also interested to uh, to, to have this conversation uh, going on, uh, we will have other stakeholders meeting uh, in the course uh, of this uh, of this project, and we will uh, keep you uh, posted. But please uh, do follow us uh, with our LinkedIn on our LinkedIn account and uh, on our uh, website. So thank you very much, and have a lovely rest of the day. Due to uh, COVID, there is no lunch for C. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah. But there's better coffee left. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, just as uh, just as more just as more information, uh, you should all have accepted first row um, an evaluation sheet. If you could compile it and leave it on your desk, we'll then collect it. And also, who came in late, if you could kindly sign the attendance sheet if you didn't know that before. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Else. <laughs> Okay. Yes, yes, yes. 